I'm John Batchelor. Good evening. I welcome my colleagues, Tegan Goddard, publisher of Political Wire, and John Avalon, the executive editor of The Daily Beast. I'm very pleased to begin this new year with these two gentlemen in our round table because we love to do gossip. We love to do political gossip. If you're well aware of the fact that in these last hours, always thinking of us, the former Secretary of Defense, and before that he was DCI of the Central Intelligence Agency, and for a moment there he was the president of a very popular Texas university, Robert Gates, is publishing a new book, Duty. It's a memoir about his time as two years Secretary of Defense for Mr. Clint, uh, uh, Mr. Bush in the latter part of the second Bush administration and two years as Secretary of Defense for Mr. Obama in the first Obama administration. So he's seen both directions. He served Republicans and Democrats and he's been a war Secretary of State inheriting a, a the disrepair of the Iraq war from uh, well, from a number of people, but certainly from Mr. Rumsfeld in 2006-2007. Tegan and John, a very good evening to you. John, I begin with you because it's featured at the Daily Beast right now, and your, uh, your correspondent and colleague, William O'Connor, has done us all the favor of speed reading through the Secretary of Defense's memoirs. The major points are is that the Secretary of Defense was present at all of the gossipy conversations that we could never get, you know, even a fly on the wall couldn't hear all this. And I think we're featuring the fact that Mr. Obama didn't have heart for his Afghanistan policy and Mrs. Clinton didn't have heart or was discouraged from her uh, candid remarks about Iraq because she was running in the Democratic primary. Any surprise here, John? Good evening to you. Good evening, John. It's great to be with you. Um, you know, it, the, the speed read we put up is of sort of the, the juiciest bits. I mean, and they're not coincidentally points of conflict, but you know, to get this kind of unvarnished look at, at the Obama White House and the Bush White House from Robert Gates, who, uh, to his great credit, is a somewhat the only person who really stayed on in a senior position, cabinet level, between the two administrations, it's, it's very illuminating. And obviously, he was there for these conversations. And you see uh, the kind of conversations that people have in power when the camera's not on. I mean, right. Hillary Clinton basically conceding that her opposition to the surge was influenced by the primary against Obama. Um, which is something that I'm sure you'll hear again in the road up to 16. Uh, you get his real assessment of, of President Obama and President Bush. Uh, very effusive about President Bush's uh, unwillingness to waver based on what was popular. Uh, he's very respectful of, of President Obama's uh, decisiveness, but really taken by the politicization of the White House crowd, how they politicized foreign policy. So it's a very illuminating book. This is an initial look. I'm glad we got it up quickly at the Daily Beast, but uh, there's going to be a lot of debate for a long time about this book. Tegan, a uh, very good evening to you, and it's not front and center with the headlines that are going to be blasted around the world for the next days, but I loved Mr. Gates' opinion of Congress, uh, uh, did, he say, did he leave anything out? Did he throw everything plus the kitchen sink at them? Good evening, Tegan. Good evening, John, and thanks for having me. Uh, you know, it's very interesting because the, the next time Gates uh, shows up in Congress, I don't think it'll be very warm for him uh, or shows up even in Washington at this point. It, it, what's, what's, what's interesting about this book, and while the speed read that the Daily Beast puts up is excellent and it's a great way to get an overview of the book, one thing that's also very clear about this from this book is that Robert Gates didn't like his job very much. And he didn't like it because he didn't like dealing with Congress. He thought the partisanship was awful. He, he said at one point during his confirmation hearing during the Bush administration that he walked into a storm of some sorts. He talks about... Um, he, he, he talks repeatedly about dealing with uh, President Obama's aides, and while he respected, as John said, President Obama's decision-making ability, he really didn't like dealing with President Obama's aides. He did not respect and did not like Vice President Biden. Um, and at one point, he really he admitted to a friend in the book that people have no idea how much I detest this job. So this is a man who actually is venting, I think, in this memoir. And uh, it's very clear that he was not, uh, he was not happy. 
happy when he left. There might not be wisdom in hiring uh, from the opposition's party a secretary of defense. But just a just suggestion to future presidents. Don't hire the other side when you're in a war. Gentlemen, the other issue, we, that was then, this is now. The other issue today that dominated the conversation in Washington was the Senate vote, 60 votes, to start the debate, the amendment process for extending unemployment. Mr. Avalon, uh, the puzzle here is the economy is improving, at least for all indications, such as the trade numbers today. And Wall Street has anticipated a good 2014. That's why the market's so high. It's a discounting event. And yet the president and the Democratic members of Congress are concerned about extending unemployment. This is a puzzle to many people, John, but it's also a puzzle to the Republican Party because it looks mean-spirited not to. What, at this point, do you believe is the turning of this debate? Is this about the future? Is this about the past? Is this about politics? Is this about charity? How do you see it, Mr. Avalon? John, it's it's very much about politics. It's not about charity. It's about larger philosophical debates that are designed primarily to appeal to the base. So it's divide and conquer. Um, I think Dean Heller, uh, the Republican from Nevada, uh, carved himself out a little minor profile and courage by co-sponsoring the bill and corralling five of his colleagues to support it. So it, it passed cloture. Um, but during this whole debate and the difficulty he had in, in, in getting Republican support, I, I, I'm reminded by, by George George W. Bush's campaign in 1999, where he visited Congress and said, I don't believe we should balance the budget on the backs of the poor. Um, that, that statement uh, sounds so out of touch with the current direction of the Republican Party and should provoke some reflection among Republicans, it seems to me. Taken unemployment insurance. There are debates here all the time by economists. I listened to uh, tonight to economists debating whether extending unemployment insurance does or does not help people get jobs. Is that what's determinative here, or is this about a run up to the State of the Union? How do you see this? How cynical do you want to be for me, Tegan? <laughs> Well, I think, you know, back in the uh, 2012 presidential campaign when Mitt Romney was caught on tape uttering his infamous 47% comments, right. um, it, it was really si a seismic uh, event in the Democratic Party. I think it woke Democrats up. It, it re Democrats recognize what they believe in. And ever since that point, it helped Obama vocalize this position on inequality in this country and the fact that the, the haves and the have-nots and this is really part of that. And I think that he believes, and I think that Democrats believe, that their best hope moving into the 2014 and then the 2016 elections is to make that make that decision very so clear this for So this is a run-up to the State of the Union. We're anticipating over these next days these pieces are going to be put together. I think we saw it before, you know, before the holidays, even though the White House insisted uh, that President Obama was not telegraphing his message in the State of the Union. Right. I wouldn't be surprised that in, uh, that in a few weeks you see exactly that message, the message of inequality and trying to do something about that and President Obama staking the rest of his term on that issue. And Mr. Avalon, do I, uh, do I follow through logically to say that the reason Mr. Obama is putting together these pieces of the puzzle for the State of the Union on inequality is because because the Affordable Care Act remains a, um, a, a path he doesn't want to take. You know, John, it, this is an issue that appeals very much to the Democratic base, but it's a real question mark, real jump ball, whether it appeals to swing voters, folks who ultimately decide elections. And while the left wing of the Repu Democratic Party is resurgent right now, um, certainly more than it's been in a long time with Elizabeth Warren, Bill de Blasio, um, I, I do wonder, uh, even with inequality objectively uh, being a problem in the country, if the economy is improving, is this... Uh, uh, the kind of policy that can help Democrats build a majority, or is it simply play to the base and feel good right now to the president's instincts? Uh, I, I wonder about the political wisdom of it, but it's definitely the direction they're going in. All right, I put, it, I put it to you, Tegan. Which is it? Is he playing to the base because he needs to hold the poll numbers that he has, or is he looking to the future, and despite the improving economy, he's still taking care of the poor? Uh, he's very much playing to the base. Uh, there's no no doubt about that, and I think that most people see the political advantages to doing that. I think John Avalon's extreme, uh, right on target about whether or not that is enough, uh, it, whether that's a, a wise electoral strategy in both a midterm election or a presidential election. That remains to be seen. But I think that Democratic strategists that I've talked, I've spoken to, um, including uh, an interview that we have up on Political Wire today with uh, Joe Trippi, the former uh, the Democratic uh, political consultant, he very 
very much believes it's a winning issue, and he believe, he very much believes that Democrats uh, can I- at least uh, blunt some of the Republican advantages that they naturally have in a midterm cycle. Joe Trippi, the genius of the Howard Dean campaign of 2004. That Joe Trippi. Uh, that's the one, John. Uh, he's on television now, but in the beginning, he was a guru for the insurgency that was Howard Dean and could be again. Tegan Goddard, the publisher of Political Wire, John Avalon, the executive editor of The Daily Beast. Mr. Avalon gives me a segue to what we will discuss next, which is the rise of the progressives of New York City with the election of Bill de Blasio. Not 180 from... Mayor Bloomberg, but 179.999. I'm John Batchelor.